Jeff Anderson and how he died in a fight during a hockey game has triggered a raging debate about the role of fighting in our national sport. On one side, those who believe fighting debases a game that's already the fastest, toughest, most exciting in the world, and that it's only a matter of time before someone in the National Hockey League is seriously injured in a fight, or worse. On the other side, those who argue that fighting is a necessary release valve and a fundamental part of the NHL. On this edition of the Fifth Estate, we're going to examine fighting in hockey through the eyes of those who know it best. You may disagree with some of what they have to say, but they all agree on one thing, that hockey and the fighting in it are governed by an unwritten law that they insist makes the sport far safer. They call it the code, and you're about to meet some of the men who, for better or worse, have lived by it. When I, uh, when I first broke in the league, I could take a punch better than, as good as anybody and not be phased. And that same punch 10 years later left me dazed, confused, and, and on some nights, lights out. Brown is as good as anybody at this in the league. And so he's won a few in his career, too. These guys are tough guys. Two big, tough men. 99% of the times when two heavyweights fight, it's something else that's gone on, and both benches know what's going to happen. And these guys basically answer the bell for their guys. Fighting is, you know, it's the toughest job in sport, I think, and definitely in hockey. You're fighting for your life a lot of times, you know, it's dangerous. You could actually die. At Vistaprint, we print everything to show off your brand. So you can print it like Simon's Restaurant and outfit your whole team. Or you can print it like Vegan Cafe Jaja and give your fans more ways to grab your brand. Print it like jewelry designer Kirsten and find a way to get noticed every day. Or go ahead and print it like Barbershop High and Tight and get totes, shirts, hats, even, ooh, fancy water bottles. Let me get one of those. Print it any way you want because at Vistaprint, if you need it, we print it. Print it all with 25% off for new customers at Vistaprint.com. How much time did you spend on manual busy work last year? You know, the repetitive little tasks that you have to do in order to keep your business running. Let Zapier take care of those tasks for you instead of letting them pile up. Get started with Zapier for free. I in a fight. Dorick is hanging on for dear life for the looks of it, but a whack on his left hand loose. If NHL fighters consider themselves a brotherhood, the man widely regarded as their champion is the Montreal Canadian Georges Larocque. And now Pilak and Larocque will drop them. In 11 years, with four teams, Larocque has heard himself called different names. Policeman, goon, enforcer. And what's the definition, whatever the name is? <laughs> Well, the definition is the number one role is obviously to look over your teammates and to protect them and to make sure that they fall safe on the ice, that nothing happens. One of very few NHL players of Haitian descent, Georges Larocque and other fighters have at least one thing in common. They didn't expect to make it with their fists. I never thought that I would fight. You know, I, I was scoring a lot of goals when I was a kid and I was bigger than everybody. I was overpowering people and I never thought that this is what I actually would do. It was the same story for Nick Kiprios from a Greek family in Toronto. I'm not going to be that guy that gets kicked out because I couldn't do anything else. I'll find another way. I'm not, I'm not leaving. I, I'm not going anywhere. I want a career in the NHL, and I'll do whatever it takes. Eventually, all NHL fighters make the choice and pay the price. Broken noses and hands, concussions of the brain, the pregame feeling of dread. Some guys I know couldn't sleep at night. They sweat. I I toss and turn it. There's some nights I didn't get good nights rest, knowing what I needed to do the next night. It's not it's not for everybody. And some guys think they have the stomach for it, but six months later they're out of the game. For Don Sanderson, the plot was similar. As a kid, he too was a minor hockey star, drafted at 16 by the Memorial Cup champion Kitchener Rangers. The, the reason why they drafted him was size and his aggressiveness in hockey. Don's father, Mike Sanderson. 
Not saying that they were looking for him to fight because that was not his role. It was just his toughness that he'd go out and make the big hit to play physical along the boards and everything else. But eventually, his NHL dream would end. At 21, cut from the team at Toronto's York University, he found a place to keep playing with the Whitby Dunlops of the Ontario Senior League. You could hear that gleam in his voice going, I'm still here, I'm still here. I don't know what I'm doing right, but uh, they love me. And um, what it was was just, a, he's not the most talented hockey player, but his heart was huge, and you, you couldn't take away his drive and his ability and, and his infectious smile. Half a century ago, the Whitby Dunlops were world champions. Today, they're former minor pros and college kids, a few steps up from the beer leagues. But for Don Sanderson, there was the same hard choice NHLers like LaRock and Kiprios had to make, to fight or not. He didn't want to fight. The only reason why he fought and, and got involved in it was because a teammate, he had to go to a teammate's aid. It was... I can't philosophize or whatever you call it like that. I'm just an ordinary guy. When you picked on one of my smaller players, I'd take care of you. If you got me that time and you didn't come back, I'd try, I'd try the next game I'd try to get with you. Protecting your teammates is the essence of hockey's unwritten law. The keeper of the code is the CBC's Don Cherry. You, you'd give a cheap shot to one of our players, to one of our stars, you should pay the price. Cheap shot to the head, cross check, head first, you have to pay. If a guy falls, if a guy's down, you don't hit him when he's down. That, that's the code. And it, it's a simple code. You have to fight with honor. You don't sucker punch a guy either. Why is it, Don, that hockey is essentially the only team sport in which fighting is tolerated? Now you're talking about fighting. We're going 20 miles an hour. We've got steel blades and we've got a club in our hand. And you know... If I can't drop the gloves, and I know people are, oh, isn't this awful? I'm not going to convince. You know what's going to happen. If they're going to stick you with a stick, what are you going to use? Your stick. It may sound like tortured logic that players breaking the rules by fighting are necessary to keep hockey from getting out of control. In almost every other sport, throw a punch and you're thrown out of the game. Only in hockey, the supporters of fighting argue that it's necessary to prevent something even worse. Though that's not how it worked for Don Sanderson in that game last December. When we come back, what do we do when the unthinkable happens? When somebody dies as a result of a hockey fight? The hockey fight that threatens to change our national sport forever. The sight was just unbearable and knowing that that's, I knew right then and there that my son probably died on the ice. He was a son every father would be proud of. Don Sanderson and his dad Mike were best friends. And since Don started playing at age 11, hockey was one of their bonds. He just was so infectious with being part of a team. It didn't matter what level or what the team was. It was his team. And he was part of that team. And Quick shot from Sanderson at the point. Now stolen by what Don didn't love was fighting though he followed the code and did it for his team. Mike Sanderson didn't appreciate that side of hockey either. I saw many, many of his games. Did I see him fight? Yes. Did I enjoy it? Absolutely not. Um, it's just, it just was, it wasn't something I was proud of watching. Uh, you I, as a father, I don't know how you can be proud of watching your son fight. Um, was it part of the game? You accepted it. Yeah, I've been involved in hockey all my life, and, and it was just part of it, was, but I was never proud of it. Then came the fateful night last December when Mike decided not to make the three and a half hour drive to see Don play. And it was like, yeah, sure. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, what, what's going to happen? I mean, the worst thing is going to phone me and say, Dad, I uh, broke my wrist. Never in a million years would you ever, 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 ever think that that'd be the last time you talk or, or say anything to your son. It's just... It was in Brantford, Ontario, two weeks before Christmas, the hometown blast entertaining their opponents from Whitby. The Ontario Senior League has stiff penalties for fighting. Do it, and you're out of the game. But Don Sanderson had already fought four times this season. 
He'd described the first to his father. And he phoned me and goes, I got in a fight, and I said, why? He says, somebody went after our captain. He says, you know what? My captain's a lot better and more important to the team. You know, and the guy dropped his glove. He says, what am I going to do, Dad? i got to defend myself. At first, the fight at the Brantford Civic Center seemed a typical hockey tussle. Two players squaring off, grabbing jerseys, dodging punches. But then, Don Sanderson's helmet came off. And as often happens, the fighters lost their balance. When they fell, his unprotected head slammed onto the ice. Back home, Mike waited for his son's usual post-game phone call. I actually phoned his cell phone, I guess it was just after 11, going, hey, like, what's... Lorna's Coral Reef is home to over 40 species of living corals and millions of other plants and animals. Healthy reefs shelter our shorelines from erosion and coastal flooding. The Florida Department of Environmental Protection is asking for your help to protect this vulnerable treasure. Report reef damage, marine debris, invasive species, coral disease and bleaching, to the Southeast Florida Action Network at cfan.net. That's seafan.net. What's up? You haven't called me. When the phone finally rang, it brought news that Don had been rushed to Hamilton General Hospital. It's serious. He's got a serious concussion, and, and so I'm driving over to Hamilton just because that's all I could think of doing. No idea how serious it really was until I walked in the hospital room, and I'll tell you that the sight was just unbearable, and knowing that that's, I knew right then and there that my son probably died on the ice. Um, just, it just wasn't, uh, wasn't fair. But one family's tragedy was about to become so much more. As Don Sanderson lay in a coma, a heated debate began growing around him. God love Don Sanderson. Yeah, Don Sanderson. We got our hockey buddy here, folks, uh, Don Sanderson. He's a rookie defenseman of the Whitby Dunlops. On TV, Don Cherry was quick to dismiss anyone who used the Sanderson tragedy to argue against fighting. Their comeback is, yeah, but we're trying to protect the player from themselves. Don't, we don't need protection. Right. If two guys want to go, that's it. We don't need protection from a uh, writer who never played the game or some guy on the radio or television who doesn't go to hockey. They don't know hockey. You and I have no confidence in the willingness or the ability of the goons that run the NHL. Bob McCowan is Canada's top sports talk show host. Like Cherry, he's built a national following with his pointed opinions. For years, McCowan has warned about death in a hockey fight. I said somebody is going to get killed in a fight. It's an inevitability. And when it happens, we'll see the hockey world turned upside down. And we will, all of this stuff will be exposed. And here we are. Here we are exposing it for what it really is. Inside hockey, those predictions were not warmly received. People like Don Cherry didn't talk to me for four years, wouldn't talk to me. And I think he forgot why he was mad at me, and so we, we started talking again. Um, and frankly, I don't even remember what the exact incident was, but it was me calling him out on his you know, crusade that fighting and fighters and tough guys are good for the sport. Let's go over it again. The players, the fans, the coaches, the general managers like it. Who doesn't like it? Well, according to the latest public opinion poll, 60% virtually of the Canadian public doesn't No, 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 you're wrong. 70% of the people involved in hockey that go to the game are for it. The other people are against it. That means we're going to ban fighting for the people that aren't involved in hockey. That, that makes sense, doesn't it? That's silly. Only 24 seconds into the first period, Philadelphia Schultz and Boston's Carol Vadney start the parade of fights. One thing Don Cherry is right about is that fights have been part of hockey from the beginning. But the nature of fighting changed in the 1970s when the Philadelphia Flyers adopted a new strategy, intimidation. We're going to be the team that nobody wants to play. We're going to be the team that you're afraid to play. We're going to be the team that will fight you as fast as look at you. We don't care how many penalty minutes we take. We don't care how many eyes we gouge. We don't care how many stitches we have to get in our face. 
We're going to be mean, nasty, and dirty. With fighting as their game plan, the Flyers won two Stanley Cups and a nickname, the Broad Street Bullies. Soon there was more fighting in hockey than ever. Line versus line. Bench clearing brawls. Players taking on the fans. Over time, the NHL has toughened its anti-fighting rules with harsher penalties for leaving the bench to fight, for fighting in the final five minutes of a game, and especially for the player starting a fight, the so-called instigator. Defenders of fighting argue that because of that instigator rule, aggressive players once kept in line by enforcers now have freer reign to do their dirty work. And they say without fighting, dangerous hits and stick fouls would get even worse. Well, first of all, as Stevie Eisenman said, you'd have little rats with visors running around, sticking. Everybody's brave then, sticking guys, high sticking, doing anything they want. How are you going to get back at them? If you can't fight, what's your alternative? How are you going to get back at them? According to Bob McCown, for defenders of fighting, it's often a one-sided debate. It, it, the more you listen to these people, the more you realize they go into complete defense mode. And they, they immediately go into the explanations for why fighting is important. You don't even have to ask them. It's just rote. It just, they just start. Would Wayne Gretzky or, or your Mario Lemieux or your Joe Sackix have had shorter careers if there wasn't any fighting? Possibly. Sorry, he hasn't played for a while. He hasn't been one of these for a while. No one knows that part of the code better than Marty McSorley. A farm kid from Ontario, McSorley served his apprenticeship in Edmonton, learning the job of NHL bodyguard at the top, protecting Wayne Gretzky. Hey, fights on the NHL level, again, two heavyweights, don't start with the heavyweights. They start with other people. They escalate to the heavyweights who are taking the responsibility for the guys on their benches. The Gretzky grabbed the wrong guy. You grab Gretzky, you're going to get McSorley. Traded to Los Angeles with the great one. His number one responsibility was always number 99. He says under the code, even legal hits on a star had to be avenged. If, if Wayne Gretzky, nothing was to happen every time somebody hit him clean, people would have been looking to hit him clean three or four times every shift all year long. How is he ever going to stay healthy? If I don't go by the other team's bench and say, fellas, that's enough. That's enough. I'm not putting up with it. But for Marty McSorley, who lived by the code for 17 seasons, his NHL career would end because of it. It was a game in Vancouver, and it began with a predictable scrap between two heavyweights. McSorley then with Boston, and the Canucks' Donald Brashear. Brashear came out the winner. So late in the game, McSorley set out to do what he claims the code says he can, salvage respect, by getting a rematch with Brashear. It, you know, so I'm trying to get him to fight me. And it's sad that I have to go to the lengths I had to go to. He did everything he could to avoid it. And he can't do that. He can't. Not in his position. He's 250 pounds. He's their tough guy. He challenged our bench the whole nine yards. And I've got a bunch of young guys on my hockey team. And I'm trying to say, listen, we're still in this playoff hunt. We have to stand up and challenge but Donald Brashear didn't interpret the code quite the same way. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't going to fight him, so a second time. And uh, yes, I was hunting their bench. I mean, and that, that was my role, and that's, that's what I want, make them lose their, their, their control, you know, make them lose control. For both of them, it was about to take a very bad turn. It's now one of the iconic images in the battle over NHL violence and fighting. They have his neck in a brace for precautionary measures. When his head hit the ice, Donald Brashear suffered a third-degree concussion. Eventually, he recovered and is now in his 15th NHL season. For what he did to Brashear, the league gave what was then its longest suspension ever to Marty McSorley. He was also fined, criminally convicted of assault, and sentenced to 18 months probation. He never played another NHL game but he still believes he had the code on his side. I'll be perfectly honest, I did a lot of things that were much more violent. That wasn't intended to be violent, and people may or may not believe that, and I, I'm comfortable with it, because I know I'm, I'm proud of my career.